The Stalinist Carnival. What did the trauma of 1935, the public campaign against his Lady Macbeth, triggered by the Pravda article, Muddle Instead of Music, do to his music? Perhaps the clearest indicator of the break is the change in the function of the scherzo in Shostakovich's work in the 1940s and early 1950s. Prior to 1935, his scherzos can still be perceived as the explosive expression of new aggressive and grotesque vitality and joie de vivre. There is something of the liberating force of the carnival in them, of the madness of the creative power that merrily sweeps away all obstacles and ignores all established roles and hierarchies. After 1935, however, his scherzos had clearly lost their innocence. Their explosive energy acquires a brutal, threatening quality. There is something mechanical in their energy, like the forced movements of a marionette. They either render the raw energy of social violence, of massacres of helpless victims, or, if they are meant as the explosion of the joy of life, this is clearly intended in a sarcastic way, or as an impotent, maniacal outburst of the aggressivity of the helpless victim. The carnival is here no longer a liberating experience, but the flash of thwarted and repressed aggression. It is the carnival of racist pogroms and drunken gang rapes. The outstanding cases are the second and third movements of the Eighth Symphony, the famous second movement of the Tenth Symphony, Portrait of Stalin, and among the string quartets, the third movement of Quartet Number no. 3, which today almost sounds like Hermann's score for Psycho, and the Furioso movement, of quartet number 10. Does this mean that, in a disturbing way, the traumatic experience of Stalinist condemnation helped Shostakovich to achieve his bitter maturity? Would he otherwise have remained a composer of the new Soviet joie de vivre, mixing jazz with aggressive rhythmic modernism? What if the mixture of melancholic oppressive drama and the destructive scherzo explosions is not the only way to reply to the experience of Stalinist terror, but rather a reply that fits in with Stalinist humanism, its reaffirmation of the old Russian tradition. What if there is a different way which is also already prefigured in another old Russian tradition, the overlapping of horror and humour as the sign of distinction of the specifically Russian grotesque whose first great representative was Gogol? What is The Nose, his most famous short story about a low-level bureaucrat whose nose becomes detached and acquires a life of its own, other than a grotesque comedy or a horror story. Indicative is here the reception of Shostakovich's early absurdist short opera, 1930, based on this story. Although it is usually played as a satire or even a frenetic farce, Shostakovich himself called it a horror story. I tried not to make jokes in The Nose. It's too cruel. So when the opera group, which recently staged it, called it, in their production leaflet, the funniest opera ever, an operatic version of Monty Python. This designation should remind us of the underlying nightmarish dimension of Monty Python's comedy. Such a mixture of horror and humour is a trademark of the concentration camp universe. This is how Primo Levi in If This Is A Man describes the dreadful Selexia, the survival examination in the camp. The Blockal tester, the elder of the hut, has closed the connecting door and has opened the other two, which lead from the dormitory and the Tagesraum, day room, outside. Here, in front of the two doors, stands the arbiter of our fate, an SSD subaltern. On his right is the Blockaltester, on his left the quartermaster of the hut. Each one of us, as he comes naked out of the Tagesraum into the cold October air, has to run the few steps between the two doors, give the card to the SS man, and enter the dormitory door. The SS man, in the fraction of a second between two successive crossings, with a glance at one's back and front, judges everyone's fate, and in turn gives the card to the man on his right or his left, and this is the life or death of each of us. In three or four minutes a hut of two hundred men is done, as is the whole camp of twelve thousand men in the course of an afternoon. Right means survival, left means the gas chambers. Is there not something properly comic in this? The ridiculous spectacle of trying to appear strong and healthy to attract for a brief moment the indifferent gaze of the Nazi administrator who presides over life and death. 
Here, comedy and horror coincide. Imagine the prisoners practicing their appearance, trying to hold their heads high and push their chests forward, walking briskly, pinching their lips to appear less pale, exchanging advice on how to impress the SS man. Imagine how a simple momentary confusion of cards or a lack of attention of the SS man can decide their fate. No wonder, then, that obscene humour is also a key indicator of the carnivalesque dimension of Stalinist terror. Recall the adventure of Shostakovich's interrogation by the KGB in 1937. I was given a security pass and went to the AKVD office. The investigator got up when I came in and greeted me. He was very friendly and asked me to sit down. He started asking questions about my health, my family, the work I was doing, all kinds of questions. He spoke in a very friendly, welcoming and polite way. Then suddenly he asked me, so tell me, do you know Tukhachevsky? I said yes, and he said how. So then I said, at one of my concerts. After the concert, Tukhachevsky came backstage to congratulate me. He said he liked my music, that he was an admirer. He said he'd like to meet me when he came to Leningrad to talk about music. He said it would be a pleasure to discuss music with me. He said if I came to Moscow, he'd be happy to see me. And how often did you meet? Only when Tukhachevsky came here. He usually invited me for dinner. Who else was at the table? Just his family, his family and relatives. And what did you discuss? Mostly music, not politics. No, we never talked politics. I knew how things were. Dmitry Dmitrievich, this is very serious. You must remember. Today is Saturday. I'll sign your pass and you can go home. But on Monday noon, you must be here. Don't forget that. This is very serious, very important. I understood this was the end. Those two days until Monday were a nightmare. I told my wife I probably wouldn't return. She even prepared a bag for me. The kind prepared for people who were taken away. She put in warm underwear. She knew I wouldn't be back. I went back there at noon on Monday and reported to reception. There was a soldier there. I gave him my internal passport. I told him I'd been summoned. He looked for my name, first, second, third list. He said, who summoned you? I said, Inspector Zakovsky. He said, he won't be able to see you today. Go home, we'll notify you. He returned my passport and I went home. It was only later that evening that I learned that the inspector had been arrested. If there was ever a carnival in which today you are a king and tomorrow a beggar, this was it. A common sense reproach nonetheless imposes itself here. Is there not a rather obvious fundamental difference between the carnival proper and the Stalinist purges? In the first case, the entire social hierarchy is momentarily suspended. Those who are up are cast down, and vice versa. While in the case of Stalinism, the unexpected and irrational changes of fortune affect only those who are subjected to power. Far from being threatened, far from its power being even symbolically suspended, the communist nomenclatura uses the irrational shifts of arbitrary terror to fortify its rule. There are, however, moments of paroxysm in which revolutionary terror effectively reaches carnivalesque dimensions. Moments in which, like the proverbial snake, the ruling party starts to eat itself, gradually swallowing its own tail. The surprising fact that the most dangerous place to be was close to the centres of power clearly distinguishes Stalinism from fascist regimes. Here are the results of the mere two years of Yezhovskina. Five of Stalin's Politburo colleagues were killed, and 98 out of 139 Central Committee members. Of the Central Committee of the Ukraine Republic, only three out of 200 survived. 72 of the 93 members of the Komsomol Organization Central Committee perished. Out of 1,996 party leaders at the 17th Congress in 1934, 1,108 were imprisoned or murdered. In the provinces, 319 out of 385 regional party secretaries and 2,210 out of 2,750 district secretaries died. In his analysis of the paranoia of the German judge Schreber, 
Freud reminds us that what we usually consider as madness, the paranoid scenario of the conspiracy against the subject, is effectively already an attempt at recovery. After the complete psychotic breakdown, the paranoid construct is an attempt by the subject to re-establish a kind of order in his universe, a frame of reference enabling him to acquire a form of cognitive mapping. Along the same lines, one is tempted to claim that when, in late 1937, the Stalinist paranoid discourse reached its apogee and set in motion its own dissolution as a social link, the 1938 arrest and liquidation of Yezhov himself, Stalin's main executioner in 1937, was effectively the attempt at recovery, at stabilizing the uncontrolled fury of self-destruction that broke out in 1937. The purge of Yezhov was a kind of meta-purge, the purge to end all purges. He was accused precisely of killing thousands of innocent Bolsheviks on behalf of foreign powers. The irony being that the accusation was literally true. He did organize the killing of the thousands of innocent Bolsheviks. However, the crucial point is that although we are here reaching the limits of the social, the level at which the social symbolic link itself approaches its self-destructive dissolution, this excess itself was nonetheless generated by a precise dynamic of social struggle, by a series of shifting alignments and realignments at the very top of the regime, Stalin and his narrow circle, the upper nomenclatura and the rank and file party members. Thus, in 1933 and 1935, Stalin and the Politburo united with all levels of the nomenclatura elite to screen or purge a helpless rank and file. The regional leaders then used those purges to consolidate their machines and expel inconvenient people. This in turn brought another alignment in 1936, in which Stalin and the Moscow nomenclatura sided with the rank and file, who complained of repression by the regional elites. In 1937, Stalin openly mobilized the party masses against the nomenclature as a whole. This provided an important strand in the great terrorist destruction of the elite. But in 1938, the Politburo changed alignments and reinforced the authority of the regional nomenclature as part of an attempt to restore order in the party during the terror. The situation thus exploded when Stalin made the risky move of directly appealing to the lower rank and file members themselves soliciting them to articulate their complaint against the arbitrary rule of the local party bosses, a move similar to Mao's Cultural Revolution. Their fury at the regime, unable to express itself directly, exploded all the more viciously against the personalised substitute targets. Since the upper nomenclature at the same time retained its executive power in the purges themselves, this set in motion a properly carnivalesque, self-destructive vicious cycle in which virtually everyone was threatened. For example, of 82 district party secretaries, 79 were shot. Another aspect of the spiralling vicious cycle was the very fluctuations of the directives from the top as to the thoroughness of the purges. The top demanded harsh measures, while at the same time warning against excesses. So the executors were put in an untenable position. Ultimately, whatever they did was wrong. If they did not arrest a sufficient number of traitors and discover enough conspiracies, they were considered lenient and supportive of counter-revolution. So, under this pressure, in order to meet the quota, as it were, they had to fabricate evidence and invent plots, thereby exposing themselves to the criticism that they were themselves saboteurs, destroying thousands of honest communists on behalf of foreign powers. Stalin's strategy of addressing directly the party masses, co-opting their anti-bureaucratic attitudes, was thus very risky. This not only threatened to open elite politics to public scrutiny, but also risked discrediting the entire Bolshevik regime, of which Stalin himself was a part. Finally, in 1937, Stalin broke all the rules of the game, indeed destroyed the game completely, and unleashed a terror of all against all. One can discern very precisely the superego dimension of these events. This very violence inflicted by the Communist Party on its own members bears witness to the radical self-contradiction of the regime, namely to the fact that, at the origins of the regime, there was an authentic revolutionary project. Incessant purges were necessary not only to erase the traces of the regime's own origins, 
but also as a kind of return of the repressed, a reminder of the radical negativity at the heart of the regime. The Stalinist purges of high party echelons relied on this fundamental betrayal. The accused were effectively guilty insofar as they, as the members of the new nomenclature, betrayed the revolution. The Stalinist terror is thus not simply the betrayal of the revolution, that is the attempt to erase the traces of the authentic revolutionary past. It rather bears witness to a kind of imp of perversity, which compels the post-revolutionary new order to re-inscribe its betrayal of the revolution within itself, to reflect it or remark it in the guise of arbitrary arrests and killings which threatened all members of the nomenclature. As in psychoanalysis, the Stalinist confession of guilt conceals the true guilt. As is well known, Stalin wisely recruited into the NKVD people of lower social origins who were thus able to act out their hatred of the nomenclature by arresting and torturing senior apparatchiks. This inherent tension between the stability of the rule of the new nomenclature and the perverted return of the oppressed in the guise of the repeated purges of the ranks of the nomenclature is at the very heart of the Stalinist phenomenon. Purges are the very form in which the betrayed revolutionary heritage survives and haunts the regime. As already noted in the case of Mao, one should specify here the role of the leader. He was exempted from these shifts of fortune because he was not the traditional master, but the lord of misrule, the very agent of carnivalesque subversion. Because of this carnivalesque self-destructive dynamic, the Stalinist nomenclature cannot yet be characterized as the new class. As Andre Waliki noted, paradoxically, the stabilization of nomenclature into a new class is incompatible with true Stalinist totalitarianism. It was only in the Brezhnev years that this occurred. Quote, the consolidation of the Soviet nomenclature, which for the first time in Soviet history succeeded in emancipating itself from the subservience to higher authorities, and constituted itself as a stable privileged stratum enjoying not only physical security, which it had obtained under Khrushchev, but also job security, regardless of performance, in effect a status similar to that of the new ruling class. The high watermark of totalitarianism was the period of the permanent purges, which aimed at the absolute elimination, not only of all possible deviations, but also of stable interest groups whose very existence might endanger ideological purity, and undermine the monolithic structure of power. There are two further paradoxical conclusions to be drawn here. Due to the specific ideological nature of the Stalinist regime, its nominal commitment to the goal of an egalitarian and just communist society, the terror and purges of the nomenclature itself were not only inscribed into its very nature, the very existence of nomenclature betrayed its proclaimed goals. They were also the revenge of the regime's own ideology against its nomenclature, which was indeed guilty of betraying socialism. Furthermore, this is why the full stabilization of the nomenclature into a new class was only possible when its members ceased to take seriously the regime's ideological goals. Therein resides the role of the term really existing socialism, which emerged during the Brezhnev years. It signals that the regime had renounced its communist vision and limited itself to pragmatic power politics. This also confirms the often noted fact that the Khrushchev years were the last years in which the Soviet ruling elite was still possessed by a genuine historical, if not revolutionary, enthusiasm about its own mission. After Khrushchev, nothing like his defiant message to the Americans, we will bury you, your grandchildren will be communists, was imaginable.